so much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, recorded live on Blog Talk Radio on March 7, 2008. Kristen Harmel's new novel, her fourth in fact, is titled The Art of French Kissing. It's a sweet, surprisingly gentle story of a young boy band publicist who's a woman from Orlando whose life there collapses and she goes to Paris to escape and maybe find herself again. It's chiclet for sure, but I enjoyed it. It also made me think more fondly of Paris than I have since the one time that my wife and I visited there back in 88. Maybe we'll get into that later. Kristen, welcome to Mr. Media. Hi, thanks for having me. How are you today? I'm doing well. How about you? Good, good. So tell us that you're in some fabulous part of the country. You know, I'm actually back home in Orlando, Florida right now. After uh, In the past week, we've been in Boston, uh, New York, uh, Atlanta, and now back in Orlando for lunch parties. Uh, Orlando. Well, that's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll just pretend you're like in Monte Carlo or something. Exactly. Can I backtrack and revise that? I'm lying yeah. on the beach in yeah. Hawaii. <laughs> Uh, come on, you're, you're, you're in the fiction business. It's all about, you know, <laughs> theater of the mind. Exactly, my mistake, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So you just released two books pretty simultaneously, um, The Art of French Kissing and uh, what I believe is a young adult novel, When You Wish. Yes, that's correct. They're both from different publishers, which I think accounts for the reason that they both came out um, around the same time. But yes, When You Wish is my first novel for teenagers, uh, basically for ages 12 and up. And it came out uh, just a couple weeks ago, so I'm really excited about that one, too. But, but tell the truth, Kristen, because everybody wants to know this. Uh, you, you, you actually outsource the writing of your books to India, so you have time for fun stuff. <laughs> I wish. I'm going to have to start thinking about that. Thanks for the idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hear they do everything for less. There you go, exactly. And, and, you know, if I could do that or just find more hours in the day, I think we'd be all set. <laughs> hey, I want to I give out our phone number uh, right off the top in case uh, there's anyone out there would like to call. I've been guilty of uh, uh, monopolizing my guests in the last few weeks. So I want to make sure if anybody wants to give a call, uh, the number is 646-595-3135. And, uh, of course, you must call in on a day that you're listening to the show live. So if you've lost track of the day, it is March 7, 2008. Uh, but if you're listening live, we'd love to have you call in. I'm sure Kristen is just dying to answer every personal question you can ask. <laughs> the more personal, the better. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And now that we've reminded her about the, uh, the theater of the mind, I'm sure she'll come up with some really good answers. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, uh, the Art of French Kissing, which is a book that I just finished reading, I mean, it, 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 from what I've read, it seems to hug very close to certain details of your own life. Um, yes. Is that true? In, in some ways, um, in that uh, it was basically inspired by the fact that I myself, uh, five years ago, went over to live in Paris sort of on a whim, the same way that the main character of the novel does. Um, and like the main character of my novel, I really didn't speak much French when I went over. And I went over uh, to live with a friend, sort of at a, a time in my life when my own life was in a little bit of uh, disarray. However, my uh, my path sort of parted from the main character of the novel when I went over there in that she actually had all these fabulous adventures of, um, you know, dealing with this crazy, you know, international rock star and, and whatever. And um I would say my adventures were much more tame. <laughs> so I, I had to use my imagination a little bit to create her world. Oh, you're just, you're, you're, I'm just feel so sad now. I really <laughs> wanted to hear that you had to, you had to, you had to tamp, uh, tamp, tamp down your own experiences to put them in the book. Well, I will have to say a few of the things that, uh, that poor Emma has to do in the book uh, include hanging upside down um, from between you know, a couple of buildings in Paris. So I'm happy that I didn't have to do anything wacky like that, but I did have, uh, I did have some crazy adventures. Paris is, um, Paris is quite a place to go, I think, as a, uh, as a, as a young person, or goodness, as, as any, any person. I think it's just such a... Um, such a wonderful city where you could just, I don't know, explore all sorts of different things. I did have quite a lot of adventures there, though. 
Well, and, I, and I'm thinking anyone reading this book is going to feel the way I did when it was over. You know, I got to go to Paris. <laughs> but I'm, then I, I think back and I think, and I, I can't believe that I wrote down it was 1988. It was actually been 20 years. But, oh, my. Um, I, I wasn't terribly impressed with, uh, I mean, the city is wonderful, but the, the people there, uh, they kind of spoil it for you. You know, I had always heard that before I went to Paris for the first time. I actually went to, the, to Paris for the first time the year before I lived there. And I had a great experience. But, you know, when I, when I went back to live there for the summer, my experience was even better. And, you know, I think that maybe, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, maybe um, Americans got a, uh, a foster reception from Parisians. Mm-hmm. But I think now, uh, you know, I, I, I really just didn't have any problems with it. I found people there to be very friendly. You know, I think it's just a, um, a different type of mentality. And... You know, it's probably the best way I can describe it is that I think that in general, and this is a big generality, but in general, I think that French people tend to warm up to, pe- to, to strangers a little more slowly, whereas in the United States, particularly in the South, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, you meet someone in a store and within 30 seconds you feel like they're your new best friend. You know, everyone's very friendly, everyone's, you know, talkative, everyone smiles. In France, in general, I think people tend to be a little bit warier of strangers, but not in any sort of negative way, just in a way that means that in a way they're a little bit more um, more genuine. Like they want to get to know you as a person a little bit before they make a judgment about whether or not to be, you know, ultra-friendly to you. So I found that when I realized that about the culture and that when I realized that um, – a reception that wasn't warm wasn't necessarily a cold reception. I think I, I, I really sort of understood where they were coming from, and I realized that they were not actually being unfriendly. I'm sorry. I'm going back to my notes here. I just want to be sure. Are we talking about Paris? <laughs> yes, we are. But, but see, you're saying you haven't been there in 20 years, and my experience of having been there more recently is that the people there actually were very kind. And, you know, I also think um, that, that one of the problems that Americans encounter is um, – going over there and expecting every French person to be able to speak English. And that's not always the case, but generally in the big cities like Paris, especially in the, you know, the retail industry or the, um, you know, if you go out to a, a meal or whatever, generally they speak at least basic English. So I feel like as an American, if you either make an effort to speak a few words of French or if you just say, I'm so sorry, I don't speak French, they'll usually warm right up to you. I think that sometimes... Americans get a negative reception when they just sort of assume that their language will be spoken. You know what I mean? Mm. I, uh, I'm dying for you to ask me what happened to me in Paris. I oh, I'm so sorry I missed my cue. What happened to you in Paris? <laughs> <laughs> All right, the only story that I will share, because it's, it's, your, it's your time and not mine. No, no, I would like to hear I'm, it. <laughs> I'm dying to tell this. So I'm there with my wife. It's like middle of the afternoon. We're starving. We go into a, uh, a cafe, a pizzeria. I, I don't, I don't know. You know, it was a place where there were there were tables for dining. There was a bar. It was the middle of the afternoon. There was no one there. The, the staff was hanging out at the bar. We walked in. We're dying of thirst and hunger, and we sit down, and uh, we wait, and we wait, <laughs> and we wait, and no one, no one waits on us. Uh, no one comes over. And I finally, I get up and I walk over and I say, excuse me, uh, and I, maybe I even said, excuse me, yeah. you know, uh, pardon. Uh, I tried. I had, you know, I had my college, University of Florida College, French. Go French. So, you know, <laughs> you know, it had to be good French. And, and uh, you, know, I, you know, I asked for a menu and uh, yeah, 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 we'll bring it to you. So I go and I sit down and we wait and we wait. And still, they, and they, they, there's only us and the... The staff. Oh no! <laughs> so we wait and we wait, and finally, uh, someone else comes into the restaurant. Yeah. Uh, and it's a it's a man with a full size standard poodle. Oh. And he goes over to the bar, and they immediately give him a drink. They give him a croissant, and then the poodle puts yeah. its paws up on the the bar, <laughs> and the poodle gets a bowl of water. And <laughs> And this is when I knew that my impression of the French to that point was not far off. Oh, no. They really, they made a real good show of how little they cared for uh, us Americans. Oh, goodness. This is in central Paris. I mean, this wasn't like we weren't out, you know, out in the boondocks. So that's uh, that's why I keep asking, are we sure we're talking about Paris? (laughs) 
terrible story. I'm so sorry that that sort of uh, shaped your opinion of Paris. You know, I, I will say that um, I have found that, in you know, it, it seems like it wouldn't be that logical, but I've found that sort of in some of the more touristy areas of Paris, they do tend to turn their nose up to uh, to tourists a little bit more, which is sort of a strange contradiction. But, um, you know, I, I think there's another thing about the French that, for me, took a little bit of getting used to because I'm very... Um, kind of rush, rush, rush from one thing to the next. And I think sometimes, particularly when it comes to eating or situations in restaurants, they just do things much more slowly. <laughs> so they were probably having a little coffee break and back or something and thought, ah, he can wait, no problem. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I think that may have been it. Well, part of this, now the reason I asked you this is that, um, and, I, and I saw the, uh, uh, the segment you did on Good Morning America. I mean, first of all, eight minutes on Good Morning America. That <laughs> but... Um, you're you're being called on, I think, I, I guess, more and more to be that American expert on Paris and 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 the French. I mean, how do you feel about that part? I love it. I mean, yeah. it, it sounds silly, but the summer that I spent living there, and it was just three months, and you know, it was just sort of a very impulsive thing to do. I just picked up and left my life here behind, took three months off my job, and went and lived over there for three months. But it was a three a three month period that I would say really really shaped my life and. Again, it sounds a little corny, but I just feel like Paris has sort of been a part of me ever since that makes sense. I've felt very passionate about the city, about the country, about learning about, you know, French customs and things like that. I've enrolled in a French class, and I take French classes now, so I'm learning to speak French, although I certainly don't speak it very well. I'm still working on my accent. But, um, but you know, I, I, feel, I, I just feel so passionately about Paris that it's an enormous honor for me to be called on in any way, in, you know, in any arena, uh, to, to talk about, you know, what makes France so wonderful. I mean, and I think like any country, there are, are there are things I don't like about France, um, uh, certainly. But but you know, I just I think that um, that in general they just have such a, a different and lovely outlook on life. And and you know, I think it taught being over there and sort of being around that. I think really taught me to appreciate the little things in life a little bit more than I have learned to here in the United States. Now, okay, but Kristen, now you're teasing me because you just said there were things you didn't like. You know, as you soon know, as I said you know that, that, I was like, he's going to ask me about that. Yeah, I mean, you know I want to hear that. <laughs> well, I'm trying to think what I could say that I don't like. You know, this, some of the things are just things that I didn't like about being over there, such as, you know, when you're over somewhere for a few months, you start, you really start to miss the things that – you know, that you took for granted at home, like being able to drive in a car that I'm familiar with or, you know, being able to speak to anyone I want in the language that I'm familiar with. So just those little things that would be, you know, pieces of traveling anywhere. Um, I will say that I think there are some upsides and some downsides to their approach to life. Um, I have always thought that it must be lovely to live in a country like that where um, – people uh, work to live rather than living to work, if that makes sense. So whereas in the United States, I think that we are sort of a very, um, you know, sort of work-driven society, like a lot of our lives revolve around our jobs and making money and, and finding success and things like that. I feel like in France, people work a short work week. And, and again, this is a, you know, I'm, 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 this is a very broad generalization. But in France, I think the tendency is more to work a very short work week and then truly enjoy and savor all of your time off. I mean, they have standard, you know, six, week, uh, six weeks of vacation every, every year, um, and the 35-hour work week is fairly standard, although I believe that's beginning to change. I think it's been uh, changed in, um, in their legal system, system, if I'm not mistaken. But for a while, I believe that they were actually limited by law to a 35-hour work week. I, I could be mistaken about that, but I, I believe that's the way that it is. And so in a way, I think that's wonderful because I think that as Americans, we could take a little bit of a lesson from that, to sort of learn to enjoy our lives outside the office a little bit better. But at the same time, I will say that, I mean, it, I think that in the United States, like, we really should also be proud of everything that we've built up, and we're such a successful nation, and we have such successful industry here. And, you know, not that France doesn't, but I feel like we're a little bit further ahead of that curve because of the attitude we have toward work. So... You know, there's sort of upsides and downsides, I think, to every every nationally prevailing attitude, if that makes sense. Well, Kristen, I, I like you so much more now that you you you've given me some something else not to be so <laughs> fond of French about. Um, I want to give out our phone number again, and we've got a call for you here. Uh, 
folks you can call in on 646-595-3135 and we have a call um, uh, let's see if the call is there I think I know who this is hey hey Bob hey. Pete Williams here hey Pete how are you doing just fine hello, hello Kristen hey Pete how are you I am fine, and I, I want to share this little anecdote first. I'm uh, out covering a uh, sporting-related event here in the Tampa Bay area, talking to a young lady who's like in a, a year out of college, uh, and she's uh, covering uh, football for a, for a TV station and talking about, geez, I don't know how I'm ever going to move up. And I'm thinking, it seemed like just the other day, and I know it was 10 years ago, but there you were still in college uh, covering uh, the Devil Rays for a now-defunct publication, and here you are. So congratulations. I know it's been a, a lot of work and, and well-deserved for you. Thank you. Uh, my, well, you know, Pete, you were actually always one of the people who really uh, was very supportive of me early on. Like, you were one of the first uh, journalists I met when I first started working, and you were always really good to me. So thank you for that. You bet. And, uh, and then obviously, I am not a, a chick lit fiction. I'm <laughs> um, but I, I recognize the importance and the attraction it has to uh, millions of readers. And I'm just wondering, where where do you get your material for, for these books? A lot of bad dates. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, you know, I, I think that the novels um, I write are very connected to sort of my own life. And, um, and I would say sort of the experiences that myself and my friends are going through right now. Um, I'm uh, I'm 28, almost 29. Um, I'm still sort of going through the uh, the sort of you know the the struggle that you do sort of in your 20s and 30s of finding yourself and of sort of finding where you fit in the world. And you know, in amongst that, there's you know the funny little adventures that I get to go on, and like I said, the bad dates. So you know, I think I sort of tie together loosely from my own experiences, sort of the the basis of these characters. And then I sort of put them in worlds or situations that are interesting to me, um, you know, whether they, are, whether they are things that I have experienced or not. For example, with The Art of French Kissing, of course, I've set it in Paris, which is a city that I feel, you know, very passionately about. Um, but the things that happen to the character there never happened to me. Those were sort of just out of my imagination. But the lessons that she learned, I feel, are, are um, lessons that I'm still learning myself and lessons that I think are fairly uh, universal for... for um, you know, women of uh, of my generation, I would say. Do you have any plans to to take these uh, characters down to the French Riviera and then have some, I guess, saucier, racier experiences for them? <laughs> um, I'll have to think about that. I'm actually in the midst of writing um, a new novel that's going to be set in Rome that will come out next summer, in summer of uh, 2009. So, um, so I'll probably tackle that first. But I do... Um, I do generally try to drop uh, characters from previous novels into my new novels, not in any major role, but, you know, I, I like to have the old characters cross paths with the new characters so that readers who have read a lot of my books, you know, sort of, uh, you know, can say, hey, I remember that person from your first book or whatever. Hey, yeah. Well, again, best of luck with everything, Kristen. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm proud to say I knew you when. Well, you know what? I'm proud to say I knew you, and I'm proud to say I still know you. You're a good friend, and I appreciate that. All right. Bob, thanks as always. Appreciate it. Thanks for, thanks for calling in, Pete. And uh, let me tell everybody that Pete uh, is a host on uh, blogtalkradio.com uh, himself. He does a show called The Fitness Buck. Uh, airs every Friday, Pete, at, if you're still there. At, no, he's gone. Okay. It's, uh, I believe it's Friday afternoons at 4 p.m. or 4.30 p.m. So uh, you might want to check that out. But, Kristen, i got to ask you, you know, when you, you – I think jokingly said that he had a lot of bad dates. It it, uh, it worried me there because I thought, boy, if, if that's all it takes to write a, a fiction <laughs> novel, then I probably inspired an awful lot. Of <laughs> um, you know, I think that's just my rationalization in my head when I go on a bad date. I just think to myself, that was horrible, but at least maybe it'll inspire a scene in a book or something. But no, I'm actually <laughs> just kidding. I really have not been on that many bad dates. I've been. Um, oh. I've been fortunate to uh, to know um, uh, and, and to go out with a, a lot of nice people, so uh, <laughs> we'll have yeah, to say it that way. Okay, she's backtracking. Again. I'm backtracking. Go. Sorry, guys. You, <laughs> you know, it's funny. It, when you said that, it reminded me of something my dad said to me when I was starting off as a writer many, many years ago. He said uh, he was – and he, he, he didn't say it in necessarily a good way, but he said, you know – the thing about you is, anything bad happens to you, you'll just write about it and make it a good thing. Exactly. There you go. Yeah, yeah that's that's you know that's really what it uh, what it comes down to. Um, what what do, I gotta ask, what does make a bad date? I mean, and I, I'm, my sense is that you're single, so yes, it's a fair question. 
What makes a bad date? Let me think. You know, I, I'm a very, um, I, I don't, I think that maybe the reason I don't feel like I've been on a lot of bad dates is because I usually just enjoy talking to people and finding out about them. And, you know, I, I just enjoy meeting new people. So usually dates are fine, but I think the ones that are bad are the ones that you feel like you're pulling teeth just to talk to a person. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, like, like when I feel like I'm interviewing somebody as opposed to having a conversation with them. To me, that's sort of the worst kind of date where you have these, you know, I ask a million questions and they just answer them with yeses or noes and then <laughs> stare at me blankly. It's like, okay, I only have so many questions. I'm running out here. So, uh, <laughs> but fortunately, I have not been on many of those. Well, that's that's a good thing. That's yes. a very good thing. Um, let's let's come back to the book. And uh, uh, Emma, uh, the lead character in the book, I mean, she comes off as kind of a doormat at the start of the book. Everybody's just kind of, uh, I guess I'll use the male description here, everybody's kind of lifting their leg and peeing on the pole. <laughs> that's um, true. Had, I mean, have you been through anything as 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 consistent and awful as she is, or did you just put pile on the poor girl in the book? No, you know what? Um, writing, writing her like that at the beginning of the book um, was actually sort of a, a personal thing for me. Like, I feel like it was um, something that to some extent I feel like I used to be like that a little bit too. And I think that's something that many novelists do is they sort of work through some of what they feel to be their own issues in their fiction. Um, I think, hopefully, that I'm mostly past doing that, but that was a lesson I had to learn a couple years ago. And, you know, at the beginning of my novel, you're right, Emma is a little bit of a doormat. She, But, you know, I think it's less of her being a doormat and more of her foolishly sort of seeing the world through rose-colored glasses. Mm-hmm. And then when it doesn't turn out that, you know, th- that her perceptions are correct, I think not having the guts to stand up for herself. And I think that's a mistake I have made in my life, too. At the beginning of the novel... Um, Emma actually uh, find, it has her boyfriend say, or her fiancé say, you know, I no longer want to be with you. And, you know, I think that's one of the most hurtful things that someone can say to you. If you're, uh, you know, like I said, she's engaged to him, and she's planning to spend the rest of her life with him. And despite the fact that in retrospect there were obvious, there were obvious problems in the relationship, you know, I think that she um, sort of chose not to see them and turned a blind eye on them and therefore became sort of a doormat. Mm. I, I, yeah, it was tough, and, and uh, I, I don't want to give away anything from the middle or the end of the book, right. but there was one, one thing at the, uh, at the beginning that happens with her. I mean, the boyfriend, I, I, don't, I, hope, I hope I can give this away. No, I mean, please, it's, it's the, at the beginning. That's no problem. All right, the fiancé dumps her, and she loses her job, and that in itself is horrible, but when her best friend sleeps with the fiancé, I just thought, oh, you know, I actually feel sorry for this character that doesn't even exist. <laughs> Well, fortunately, I've never had anything like that happen to me before. But, you know, I guess I just wanted to create a situation in the book where she sort of felt like everything that she defined herself by had been sort of ripped away. And I think part of my point with doing that was to sort of show that I think all too often in life we define ourselves by the things that are outside of us, you know, who we're dating or who we're engaged to or who we're married to, for instance, or what our job is, you know, or even who our friends are. And... I think that that's sort of a mistake. Like, I think that you can rely on those people and love those people around you and believe in those people, and, you know, especially if they truly are good people. But I think that um, a lesson that Emma learns through the course of the book and that I feel I'm still sort of learning through the course of my life is that it's, um, it's important to define yourself by what's inside of you, you know what I mean, and, and who you are as opposed to all those external factors. And I guess I sort of wanted to create a situation where Emma was forced to learn that the hard way. Mm. Um, yeah, that was tough. Now, I wonder, I mean, was there a moment in your life where something clicked for you, where you became a very aware, very you know, self-assured, uh, everything, you know, the world just kind of came together for you? Gosh, um, in, in my own life? Yeah. You know, I feel like I'm still getting there. I, you know, I... Um, um, I feel like I have a lot more self-confidence and, and self-assuredness than I used to, but, um, but you know, I, I feel like I'm still kind of growing into that. Um, you know, I, I, I don't quite have myself figured out yet, and I certainly don't have the world figured out yet. And I think, again, that's something I'm just sort of exploring through my writing. And this sounds silly, but it's, you know, like you mentioned at the beginning of the program, this is my fourth novel now, and I feel like with every novel, I feel like my writing has grown, and, and I hope that you know people who have read a few of my books would agree with that. 
But, you know, I also feel like it's been almost therapeutic for me because I work through, I sort of work through these issues that I feel like are issues in my own life. And sort of through the characters, I, I feel like I learn a little bit and I become a little bit more confident. So, I, you know, I, I sort of feel like I'm still a work in progress. But, um, but you know, shoot, maybe I should be writing like six novels a year and then I'll be a complete, you know, a totally complete human being within the next couple of years. <laughs> well, if, if you decide to go that route, I really recommend the, uh, the India, the outsourcing. <laughs> Exactly. Um, the outsourcing. Right. I'll just I'll just write the outline. Yeah. <laughs> um, I uh, oh I uh, we just we, there's a, uh, a a web chat that goes uh, alongside the uh, uh, Mr. Media interviews and uh, Missy three 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 just asked wanted to ask you a question. Oh, okay. I don't, is, I don't know if this is serious or not. Um, she says I hear Disney is casting for the lead role in their new live action Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> And they're looking at you for the part. Is this true? Missy uh, and her husband, Al, um, were the first people who gave me my break in journalism. Way back when I was 16 years old, and I, um, and I pitched them a story about the, uh, I believe it was the St. Louis Cardinals Instructional League, which was happening in Tampa Bay. I actually really wanted to be a sports reporter at the time. And I didn't tell them my age, but they, um, and when, you know, they met me fairly soon after and realized how young I was. But they, um, you know, I don't know that I'd be doing what I'm doing today if it was not for them. They really, uh, Missy and Al, who ran at the time Tampa Bay All Sports and now um, run Accent Magazine and Fight Zone, um, they, they really, uh, I really completely put their trust in me, helped me to grow as a writer, and sort of gave me my start in the business. And they always tease me and say that I look like Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> That's where that comes from. <laughs> I see. I see. I'm, I, like, I, uh, I, I have to tell you, I, I guess so we have something in common. We are both graduates of the Martino School of Photo Journalism. Oh, see, I didn't know. I didn't know you knew the Martinos. That's wonderful. Uh, I do. I, and I, I, I wasn't sure when I asked you the question. I, I knew who Missy 333 was, but I didn't know if you'd know. And so, uh, yeah, uh, uh, this is going to be really boring for anybody listening. But, uh, uh, yeah, I actually worked for uh, Al's brother, uh, Ray. Oh, wonderful! Okay. Twenty years ago, and uh, learned uh, uh, magazine uh, layout and and design. And of course, of course, no one does it that way anymore. We did it by hand. On, you know, <laughs> had a typesetting machine and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I've known them a long time. That's funny. I, it's a small world. It, small world, and but look at the look at the legacy that uh, the Martino family is creating. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true, and they're good people. No they're incredible that. people. Yes. That's so funny. Uh, so how come the sports writing didn't work out for you? Or you know, no, you know, I, I, it did. I mean, I loved it. I loved doing that. Um, but when I was in college, um, I really hoped uh, my senior year of college to get an internship at Sports Illustrated. So I had applied to um, at the Time Incorporated uh, magazine internship program, hoping that I'd be placed at Sports Illustrated. And instead, I was placed at People Magazine. And I thought, oh, I don't know if this is something, you know, that's really going to be up my alley. And I loved it. It was one of the best experiences of my life. I had a fabulous summer working for people. Um, I worked hard. The bureau chief uh, at the time, whose name was jo Joseph Harms, um, put his trust in me, and they wound up uh, hiring me. And I've been working for them for eight years now as a as a uh, contributor. So um, I still do sports stories um, for people uh, occasionally. Um, if they need a sports story in the southeast, I'm, I'm generally the one to do it, or have been in, until recently. But um, uh, and I still love doing that. I, I really um, enjoy sports, particularly baseball and college football, as you know, as, as a Gator. Um, but uh, but yeah. So it it what I had always enjoyed about sports though was getting to know um, sort of the people behind the teams and and the the personalities behind the athletes, like that kind of thing. I liked doing the personality profiles. So it was actually a very natural. Um, move to work for people instead. Hmm. And you've done some other uh, magazine stuff as well, I guess. Yeah, I, um, I primarily work for People Magazine when I do magazine writing, um, but I also do work for Runner's World, and I wrote a medical column for American Baby for quite a while. Hmm. Um, I've worked for Men's Health in the past. I've done some writing for Women's Day, um, Health Magazine, uh, just a bunch of them. I've written for probably dozens of magazines over the years. It's something I really enjoy doing. That's cool. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I was asking when, if there was a moment where you became, you know, more self-assured, but I'm kind of wondering, too, you're out, uh, you know, for each book. I imagine you get out. You, you just recently have been out touring on this book, these books. Um, 
What are the women that you meet? What, what do they want to talk to you about most? I mean, is it your characters, your success, your uh, uh, smoky eyes? What is it? <laughs> My smoky eyes. Um, you know, a lot of times they want to talk about something that has happened in the book that, that meant something to them. Um, you know, I get a lot of emails from readers who say, you know, I really connected with, um, with Harper in your book, The Blonde Theory, when she did this or when she said this, or, you know, a very similar experience happened to me, or I loved how, you know, it'll, it'll be something that sort of connects to something in their lives. So generally they want to talk about how, um, how something in one of my novels has touched them, which means so much to me. I mean... You know, when you're sitting in, you know, at your computer writing a novel, you kind of think, like, it's almost like writing into a vacuum. So it's amazing when someone comes up to you and not only has read your novel, but has actually been touched or moved in some way by, by something, you know, that you've written. So um, that has been a wonderful experience for me. But a lot of times people want to find out, um, you know, about how to, how to write a book, too. So I'm always happy to talk to them about that. And, in fact, um, I teach a novel writing class for an organization called MediaBistro.com, mm. and that's actually been filling up every semester. I, I really enjoy it. It's an eight-week course, and I get to teach it online and um, and talk to aspiring writers about how to put together a book. So, which has been a good learning experience for me too. Uh, Me- Media Bistro uh, does a, a lot of good work. They're uh, a good people there. So, Absolutely. Laurel Laurel Tooby, I think, is the founder of that. Um, all right. So, on Good Morning America. Yes. You talked about the things that French women know that American women know, don't yes. know. Now, uh, i got to tell you, Kristen, I don't really care about that. But <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what I do want to know is what is different about French men? We're back to the original theme here. But what's different uh, about French men from American men? In, in other words, what is it that those Frenchy guys, what is it that those guys have that Mr. Media doesn't? That's what I mean. <laughs> Well, I'm sure none of them have anything on you, Mr. Meaty. <laughs> right. Good answer. Um, but, uh, oh, gosh, that's a good question. Um, well, first of all, I'm, I, as, as I think probably many girls are, am a sucker for accents. So, you know, you put on that, uh, that sexy French accent. Ah, oui, oui, Exactly. <laughs> no, so, uh, you know, I, I think that um, probably one of the major differences that I can think of is that really, in general, French men. And again, I'm. I'm. This is a broad generalization, and you know, it's hard to sort of general generalize about an entire, you know, culture or country full of men. But in general, I would say that French men tend to be um, more unabashedly uh, romantic, if that makes any sense. Um, you know, I, I was uh, sitting at a bar with a friend of mine one time in Paris. You know, just with with a female friend of mine. And this French guy tried to start talking to us, and he didn't speak any English at all. And this was five years ago when I didn't really speak any French. So there was really no basis for communication between us. So after, like, literally not being able to communicate, he turns away for a moment and comes back about ten minutes later with something scribbled on a gum wrapper, which he handed to me. And he had written me a poem in English, like, I guess using the only English words that he knew. (laughs) And at the end, asking me to see Paris with him. So it was cheesy, to be sure, and I think it's sort of funny that it happened. But, you know, I can't imagine, I can't imagine ever have, having that experience in the United States with someone who was actually serious. And this guy was dead serious. He really thought that his poem was going to, like, sway me into, you know, being swept <laughs> off my feet and, you know, in the beauty of Paris. But um, I, that silliness aside, I do feel that French men do tend to be um, more romantic and not at all ashamed of it. I think there's more of a an emphasis on being, um, you know, sort of uh, just masculine and sort of like keeping your feelings a little bit, you know, maybe playing your cards closer to your chest here in the United States, whereas I think in France people wear their, men in particular, wear their emotions on their sleeves a little bit more. Now, having said that, I did read your book, so I do know about the, the, uh, the French uh, character in there who... Um, uh, makes a big play for Emma, and he's so he's so sweet. He does this. Well, it turns out he does that to every American woman. Yes, that's because, true. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm reminded of that uh, uh, Gina Davis movie from years ago, Earth Girls Are Easy. You know, yes. So apparently, I mean, is part of it over there that that they they think that American women are easy? Is that you is know? That part of I, I think that um, I I I don't know that they think that American girls are easy as much as some of the slimy guys, and there are slimy guys, I think, in every country. <laughs> so, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so I would say the small handful of slimy guys that exist in France 
probably do look at American girls to some extent as easy prey because, uh, quite frankly, we probably are. I mean, <laughs> we, we're used to men, like I said, sort of being a little bit more, um, or maybe like withholding their emotions a little bit more. Um, so I think it's it's easy as an American girl to listen to a guy, you know, saying sweet things to you in that wonderful French accent, you know, to the backdrop of this beautiful city, you know, and, and telling you how beautiful and lovely you are. They've never seen anyone as lovely as you. And, you know, I think that there are certainly, you know, cheesy guys in the United States, though, who would use the same lines with the same amount of success. So, so I, I suppose um, I don't think it's just American girls that would be singled out as easy targets by those type of people. I think it would probably be any girls who look like they could be easily swayed, you know? All right, but it really, it really does come down to the accent, right? <laughs> the accent, perhaps. I mean, gosh, it's such a, such a beautiful accent. I, I wish I had a French accent. I wish you did, too. <laughs> um, I, w- I would have to start talking in one. <laughs> yeah. That would, yeah, right. But if you did have the accent, you wouldn't be talking to me. So let's leave things as they are. Um, so you you, uh, you told us a little bit um, about how you got your the magazine break. Uh, you got the internship. You wound up with People instead of Sports Illustrated. How did you get your um, fiction break? How did you get How did you get the first book published? Was there you know Was there a good story to that? Well, you know, I had always um, wanted to write a novel, and I thought to myself, um, you know, I'm too young to do this. I don't have the life perspective yet. Um, And then, you know, to be honest, it really was that summer that I went over and lived in Paris. It made me think to myself, why not try? I mean, yes, I could just stay on the fast track and try to, you know, do everything I can in in the magazine world, or I could continue to do that, but also sort of pursue my dreams. So... Slowly, I started writing my first novel. Um, with, you know, I had not contacted an agent yet. I had not contacted a publisher. I just came up with the idea for a story, and um, I had a few friends in Tampa at the time that all worked in the same office. And I said, hey, I'm going to try to write this book, but, like, I need to stay motivated. Could I send you one chapter a week so that I know that, like, someone's waiting for it? And they were all excited, and I started sending them one chapter a week. And so slowly, I actually wrote this first novel. Um, and then when I finished it, I started sending it off to, um, to literary agents. And I got an agent, and um, we did a little bit of work on the book. They thought I needed to make it a little bit funnier um, and a little bit shorter. And so I made those, uh, those fixes that they suggested. And then they sent it off to, at the time, Warner Books, which is now Hachette Book Group, my, my current publisher that I'm with now. And uh, they made an offer almost right away. Um, I had the chance to work with a wonderful editor there named Amy Einhorn, who now actually has her own imprint. She's just a fabulous super editor, but she's, she was the one who, um, who really gave me my first chance, and I was uh, so happy with that and so happy that I'm still with Hachette Book Group. I have another wonderful editor there named, uh, now named Karen Kostolnik, and she's, um, she's, she's equally fabulous. I, I feel like I've really um, become a part of a really wonderful family there. And uh, would you? I, I was going to ask you about success, but would you describe yourself as successful at this point as a novelist, or are you still, you know, looking looking for that around the corner? I'm... You know, this is the first year that I would say yes to that question. The first yeah. few years, I always sort of felt like, um, well, I had these books out, and you know, it was so exciting to walk into like any Barnes and Noble in the country or any Borders and see my book sitting there. It was like, it, it still took a little bit of getting used to, like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. That's my novel, you know. Um, this is the first year, though, that I feel like something has really clicked into place. I'm having a lot of people turn up at my launch parties. I'm having these launch parties all over, um, all over the country, but I'm having a lot of people turn up to these parties and, and, you know, strangers, people I've never met, and say things to me like, oh, my God, I'm so excited to read your book. I loved your first two books. I'm such a fan. And it's like, I, I, I guess I never thought I'd get to the point where people would say that. I, I always kind of look at them like, really are you sure you have the right person like it just it it um it, it's so it's just an amazing amazing feeling so i guess because of that I, I do feel like i've um achieved like a moderate level of success but i feel like i have a long way to go i mean i'm you know it's funny I, i've had people ask me before like oh you must be so rich now and obviously these are people who have probably never you know <laughs> a book or, you know, known what a, a book contract could be so I'm certainly not speaking to you from the deck of my yacht or anything like that yet but <laughs> you know I, I do feel like I'm in a very good position where I, you know I feel like I'm, I'm beginning to get readers who are reading all of my books um, you know and, and I'm able to support myself doing this it, I, it, and at the end of the day I think that's what it's all about I, I have a life that I'm very very happy with 
and I'm doing something I love. And to me, I think that's all you need to feel successful. Uh, do you indulge yourself in any way from time to time? I shop too much. <laughs> I am. Um, it sounds so stereotypically, you know, girly, and I know I sound like I'm trying to be uh, Carrie Bradshaw from Sex and the City, and perhaps <laughs> the way I am. But I, uh, I'm obsessed with shoes, <laughs> and um, and and I, I do love to, uh, I do love to shop. And cupcakes, they're my other indulgence. I'm obsessed with cupcakes. <laughs> so, cupcakes. cupcakes yes. <laughs> So a guy shows up at your door with a French accent, puts a couple of cupcakes in each of two new shoes, and he's got an egg. I'm sold, exactly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's yeah. all you need to charm me, exactly. Now, I'm learning so much here. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, and I have to figure out how to apply all this to a 20-year 20 20 marriage. So I'll there you go. Just show up with some shoes, some shoes and some yeah. cupcakes for your wife and speak French. Yeah, that'll be, a, that'll be an, yeah I'll speak French. That'll, that'll, be, that'll be the tip-off. Um, <laughs> I, and, and okay, speaking of girly moments, I got to ask you: Have you had any? Maybe this is kind of a boyish thing, but have you had any in-your-face moments with girls that you went to high school or college with since the books have come out? Um, what do you mean by in-your-face moments? Oh, I think you know. Uh, you know, have you? Uh, you know, someone who did not think very highly of you in high school or college, somebody you were competitive with for her. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no! I've certainly had nothing like that. In fact. Um, at my Atlanta party and my Orlando party, I actually had uh, girls who I had gone to high school and college with, which was really nice. I, um, I, um, in fact, even saw in New York. Um, not, not this doesn't answer the the girl part of the question, but um, I actually saw a boy that I had gone to kindergarten through third grade with at my New York party. So I think I'm fortunate in that. Um, hopefully, I mean, I'm sure there's some people out there who probably don't like me, but um, but I, I think that for the most part, I I. I I have not made many uh, many enemies along the way, so I've been fortunate in that. Okay, this boy from third grade, what, did he have a French accent? What, how do you remember? No, no, you know what? I remember him because, well, uh, we had gotten in touch uh, recently on Facebook, which is obviously just a great way to connect wow. with um, with people, but he was actually my, my uh, very first crush, my very first crush back in the third grade. <laughs> when I was nine years old, I had a crush on him, and I actually saw him again for the first time since we were ten. Okay, well, that I can buy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that makes sense to me. Now, um, and, and, and Pete, I think Pete kind of was heading in this direction uh, when he called before. Um, now, I kept turning the pages in the Art of French Kissing, thinking, okay, there's going to be sex on the next page, right? <laughs> no, not this page? Okay, it must be the next page. And, and, and just seeing the book, as, as tame as the book looks, it, it is called the Art of French Kissing. So my wife sees it. I'm reading it, you know, over the course yeah. of a few days. and. And she's like uh, thinking the same thing. And she made me swear that I would keep this book out of my daughter's eyesight. Oh, how but funny. How, how old is your daughter? She's 11. Oh, how funny. <laughs> so I get, I get to the end of the book. Uh, there's no sex. So no, what, is it that I, what is it that I, as a man, uh, do not understand about chick lit? What did I miss here? Oh, chick lit is generally not sex. There's generally very little sex in chick lit. And, and, if, there, and if there ever is, it's never like... It's never like in a romance novel where it's like a where it's a sex scene for the purposes of, you know, getting you turned on or whatever. You know, it's it, the only sex scenes I've ever seen in chick lit novels are ones that have to do with like the growth of a character or the growth of a character's relationship. Um, it, it, chick lit is a very different genre from romance, and I think um, I think a lot of people who don't read a lot in this genre assume that it's um, it's a very close. Um, sister to, to romance novels, and it's really not. So I would say that chiclet. I would describe chiclet in general as more um, basically stories that are often lighthearted in some way, but stories that are basically at their core stories of um, of women finding themselves and of developing um, or learning some major lesson in their lives. You know, it usually involves some level of um, you know romantic interest, but there are also a lot of chiclet novels that are written about women who are married or women who are, you know, new moms or even women who have been recently widowed. Um, so I think chiclet spans a fairly, I, I think that sort of encompasses a lot of different um, types of novels and a lot of age ranges too, but um, generally there's not a lot of sex in chiclet. Sorry, sorry well, to disappoint you. you well, especially you, if you're telling me that, you, you, that a lot of it is marriage related. I know there's no sex, so. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you, you should have, my, the title of my first novel was actually called How to Sleep with a Movie Star, and right. you, should have, you should have heard the reactions about that. I mean, my God, I've been asked 
50,000 times which movie star I've slept with. And I keep telling people, nobody, nobody. But I think I'm going to start just saying, you know, I never kiss and tell and just leaving it up to their imagination. Okay, but now you, you say what you will. But ladies and gentlemen, go to KristenHarmel.com and the picture that pops up is her with Patrick Dempsey. Who is very, very happily married with three wonderful young children and a gorgeous, gorgeous wife. So he's just someone okay. I've interviewed a few times. And he's an extremely, extremely nice man. And okay. yes, I admit to thinking he's one of the most attractive people on the planet. <laughs> as, as, as Chris Farley would do, uh, interview that, and he'd be holding up his fingers like quote unquote interview. <laughs> no, times. Okay. no, 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 just okay. interview. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, but, well, so okay, uh, so I, I get that. Now, what is the difference between a chiclet like this that there is no sex, which is okay, I get that, you know. Some, some people don't want to read that stuff. <laughs> but, um, and then doing a uh, young adult novel, which I'm assuming there probably is no sex in either. Well, yeah, of, of course, no. Cer and, cer you know, certainly not in the ones that I write. But, um, you know, it, it's, um, I think at their core, they're sort of very similar types of novels. Um, and a lot of writers who write Chicklet also do a very good job with, um, with young adult novels. I think it's a pretty easy transition. Because it's, it's obviously different different types of settings, different types of scenarios, and obviously a different age group. But I think in general, we're doing the same types of character explorations and following our characters sort of on the road to learning a little bit more about themselves. You know, the lessons tend to be a little bit different because the girls in the books are, you know, 15, 16, 17, as opposed to, you know, uh, 28 or 35 or 42. You know what I mean? So they're obviously at a different place in their lives in terms of discovering you know who they are and what they want out of life but i think um in general it, i think they deal with similar emotions and similar complications in their lives and it's funny you know if you think about it if you look if you think back to you know high school i i think that sometimes the issues that you confronted in high school are sort of issues that continually reappear throughout your life it just sort of in different form if that makes sense mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I don't know if my wife will agree, but I actually got to the end of this and I thought, my daughter actually could read this book. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I, it's, it's important to me just personally not to, um, not to really write anything in, inappropriate in books. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm certainly not marketing The Art of French Kissing necessarily to, like, preteens, of course, but, but there's certainly nothing in there that would be inappropriate for, um, for, you know, a girl who's like 15 or 16 or 17 to read. And certainly the same with my teen novel, When You Wish, which is geared toward ages 12 and up. But, um, you know, I talked to a 10-year-old last night about it at my Orlando party. She was a really sweet 10-year-old sweet who was telling me that she wanted to be a writer when she grew up. And um, I gave her a copy of the book because I thought, you know, yeah, she might really like this. And, and, you know, I told her if she wanted to email me, we could keep in touch and talk about writing and stuff. So, you know, I, I, think, that, uh, I think that I really try to keep the books um, very appropriate. Well, so uh, what's next? Uh, have you, you know, do you have another book already in the pipeline? Are you writing? What, what are you working on? I do. I have two books due at the end of the month of April, so I'm sort of losing my mind right now. I have one more um, young adult novel due and one more uh, women's fiction or, you know, chiclet novel due uh, at the end of April. So I am bearing down and working hard on those. And then when they're done, I'm actually going to take a trip to Paris and Rome, uh, Rome, because my next book is going to be set there, and I need to do a little bit of um, research. And Paris, just because I can't go all the way to Europe and not go to Paris. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's what's uh, that's what's in the next uh, couple months for me. Well, I want to recommend Vienna to you. I just thought that was a far more romantic and and uh, wonderful city than Paris could ever hope to be. You know, I've heard I've heard that Vienna is really beautiful, and I regret that I've never been there. So maybe I will have to do that either this um this spring or when I go back in the fall. Well, I'll, I'll watch for that. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's let's end with this. Uh, okay. We're both Florida Gators, uh, okay. apparently proud Florida Gators at that. Uh, is there anything you'd like to tell the world about uh, membership uh, to the world's best and at times most reviled alma mater? <laughs> um, you know, just that, gosh, I'm so proud to have gone to school there. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful school. And I, you know, I, I say that from the bottom of my heart. I feel like I could not have gone to college at a better place. It was a fabulous balance of a wonderful education as well as, you know, great social life and, of course, you know, wonderful athletic life. I mean, God, who's better than the Florida Gators? Yeah. That's the spirit. <laughs> What's that? 
I said, that's the spirit. Exactly. Um, you know, so I'm extremely proud to be part of the Gator Nation, and I think I owe, you know, whatever level of success I've had largely to the education and the encouragement that I got there from some really, truly wonderful professors. That's great. Well, uh, Kristen, thank you so much for joining us at Mr. Media today, and continued good luck. Thank you. It was such a pleasure to be on your show. Thanks for having me, and good luck to you as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and, folks, uh, you can order uh, Kristen Harmel's books, The Art of French Kissing, When You Wish, How to Sleep with a Movie Star, and The Blonde Theory at fine booksellers everywhere, online, and even in real brick-and-mortar stores. And if you're interested in seeing Kristen live, she's currently promoting her books on tour. To see where she'll be next, you can go to her website, www.kristinharmel.com. She's also on MySpace, myspace.com slash K-R-I-S-D as in David, H as in Harmel, 5-4. And uh, if you enjoyed this uh, program, I hope you'll uh, mark it as a favorite on uh, whether you're listening to us on Blog Talk Radio, iTunes, Blueberry, Zencast, wherever you found us. We'd appreciate that. For dozens more celebrity and media newsmaker interviews, surf over to our main web- website, if I could talk, www.mrmedia.com, where you can listen to my earlier conversations with Billy Bob Thornton, Cheryl Hines, Robert Schimmel, Milo Ventimiglia from Heroes, David Fury, Anna Gunn, Stefan Pastis, and many others. And you can also read full transcriptions there. And again, please come back next week for another Fridays with Mr. Media.